You're listening to the Common Descent Podcast. Hello, David. Hello, Will. And hello, listeners. Welcome to episode 56 of the Common Descent Podcast. Today, we are going to get into the history of evolutionary theory. Yes, what a fitting subject so soon after our Wallace episode. Indeed. We are going to, in this episode, kind of go step by step through how historically did we arrive at the theory of evolution we have today. How, what did we used to think? How did pieces of it come into our our mindset and our our accepted view of the world and how did we break down previous ideas that you know contradicted it you mean darwin didn't just crawl out of a primordial ooze and say evolution no he did not evolution complete <laughs> it was a very long very interesting and crazy and weird at times yeah. <laughs> path. So lots of crazy ideas to get by. Uh, this episode was inspired off of a suggestion by one of our listeners. Brian on Twitter suggested evolution slash natural selection. As our first episode actually focused on the topic, uh, we thought it was fitting to actually describe what is the concept of evolution? How did we get there? Why do we think the things we do? Because as David just made the point, we didn't just go, hmm, you know what? I think all of this makes sense. All right, let's move on. We had a lot of ideas before we got to the one we work off of today. So in this episode, we'll come to understand evolution the way that our scientific ancestors did, by being wrong a bunch and then figuring out where we are now. Wrong in interesting ways. Wrong yes. in interesting ways. It ain't that science. <laughs> being wrong in interesting ways if that's not the tagline (laughs) i don't know what is maybe that's the new podcast tagline (laughs) common descent podcast wrong in interesting ways makes you think (laughs) that could be a side (laughs) a side series yeah here were times we were wrong in an interesting way in the history of science somebody on the internet did point out that i mathed incorrectly in episode 55 i did a little like off the cuff math and i remember talking about in the moment i was like well that would be this percentage of blah 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 and while i was saying it i was like i should probably pause and double check these numbers it'll be fine (laughs) it wasn't fine i was wrong go to twitter and find out and then the rover embedded on mars yeah (laughs) (laughs) i would yes i was off by a decimal point that's exactly what it was anyway so before we get into the discussion as usual We have some announcements, uh, a few announcements, but some exciting ones. First and foremost, as has become a tradition, we have a Patreon where people can support us. And when you support us at a certain level, we shout out your name and we have some names to shout out. First, welcome, Jesse. And our other patron requested that we give a shout out to William, who I quote, is the best scientific collaborator out there. Uh, Congrats, William. So thank you both and welcome to the Patreon. That's adorable. It's so great. I love it. (laughs) And my next announcement, we made part of this announcement uh, last episode. We mentioned that we will indeed be putting out merch last episode. Merch. And that is going to be happening. We have set up a Zazzle store and we are putting the, as we record now, putting the final finishing touches on it and it will be up and available to you with this upload, with this listening that you are doing. Yes, by the time you're hearing this, go to your internet. Go. We'll put it in the description here. We'll post yes. it on social media. Oh, you we're going to plaster this link everywhere. Merch! Common Ascent Podcast merch. T-shirts, mugs, and stuff. And it's going to be great with our logo on it. So for all of you who are just hotly jealous of our awesome shirts at Dragon Con, they will now be available for you. Yes, yes, yes. And we'll expand the store as time goes. Right now it'll be sort of simple beginning stuff. And then... We'll see how people like it. We'll see what people want, and we will continue doing merch. 
one of the nice things about Zazzle is if you see a product that you wish we had put the logo on and you want to, you do have that option on Zazzle. So even if we don't get to doing it ourselves, you can you can make your own products and it all is official. Yes. So check that out. And if you buy stuff, send us pictures of what you got. We would love to see how people are making use of, our, of oh, the store. Absolutely. Uh, one other thing we should point out, uh, if you are a patron at the level where you get bonus audio, we have uploaded a new thing that we're going to start uh, throughout this year, which is bonus news. Yeah. So we had a little discussion. It's like 25 minutes or so of us just talking about extra news that we didn't get to talk about throughout February. So if you're a patron, check it out. And hey, if you're not a patron, look at all these goodies you can get. <laughs> so yeah, we got some cool stuff coming out, some new stuff coming out, and that's going to wrap up the news for this episode. Or the that's going to wrap up that's the gonna start the news, Will. Indeed it you're will. You're getting ahead of us. You're 30 was... minutes ahead in this episode. I'm excited. So, every episode we like to go over a bit of recent news in the fields of paleontology, evolutionary biology, and other interesting sciences. So that we stay up to date, so that you stay up to date. And to start us off, I'm going to turn things over to my co-host, David. Thanks, Will. How about some frogs? Frogs? Sounds interesting. Fossil frogs. Prehistoric, ancient, fossil frog. <gasps> this is a report, a new study that has come out with the remains of late Triassic frogs. These are among the oldest known frogs in the fossil record. Cool. These have come from the Chinle Formation in Arizona. Late Triassic, about 216 million years ago. The Chinle Formation is famous for lots of dinosaurs and archosaurs, but not very much is known about the microvertebrates. So we've talked about this term before where we talk about microvertebrates. When we are at the gray fossil site, for example, we are pulling the big bones out of the ground and then we're screening and sifting through all the sediment to get the tiny things. But this is something that most fossil sites don't do because it's costly and it takes a lot of time and effort and people and most fossil sites just don't have that luxury and they are trying to pull up dinosaurs and stuff so that's not what they're interested in. Here, a group of researchers uh, led by Michelle Stocker uh, et al. who have published in Biology Letters and we'll put, we'll put a link up to the press release, uh, I think it's press release from Virginia Tech News, have found several small pieces of pieces of frog hip bone. Uh, this is interesting because frogs are often, fossil frogs are often identified by their hip elements because the hips in frogs are very distinctive. Yes, very weird. They call them the chinle frogs. They are all, all of these bones are super tiny, uh, millimeters across. The largest piece, I believe Michelle said in the video, is about six millimeters long. Wow. And they belong to multiple individuals of frogs that would have been around half an inch long. Jeez. As Michelle says, Michelle Stocker, by the way, the lead researcher here, I have met Michelle. She is a nice person and a cool scientist. And finds neat little frogs. And apparently finds, well, a lot of the time she's working, at least my experience with her, I talked with her when she was working on phytosaurs, which yeah. were the big things that aren't quite crocs, but boy, they could fool you from the Triassic. They, they're there. Uh, I, I can't believe they're not crocs. And yes, exactly. They're still really cool. <laughs> <laughs> Quote from Michelle, the chinley frog could fit on the end of your finger. Aww. Tiny little frogs. The oldest known frogs in the fossil record are about 250 million years old from Madagascar and Poland. These frogs are about 35 million years younger than that. But they are the oldest frogs in North America, the oldest frogs found near the equator. Oh. Those other frogs were at higher latitudes during the late during the, the, the time period when they were found. And these are the first frogs found directly associated with early dinosaurs and phytosaurs. Interesting. Which is pretty cool. In fact, the picture that's been going around with this uh, news study is a little frog crawling in the mouth of a phytosaur. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty great. <laughs> which is great, which has prompted, I, I see, I, I made the comment, and I think I saw somebody else make the comment, that, well, no wonder they're extinct. They crawled into phytosaur mouths. <laughs> well, and it's, if I, I don't know for sure this is what inspired the artist, but there's a, a famous, like, it was a Nat Geo picture or something 
equivalent of a frog hanging off the bottom jaw of a croc, little baby oh, crocodile. Oh, that might very well be. And like trapezing like, Ugh. That and, might be the inspiration, actually. Yeah. That's funny. It's it's neat. I saw it and immediately was like, eh, that's clever. I, I see what you did there. <laughs> the authors have not named the new frog. They have not given it an official scientific name because, they explain, they're still looking through the sediment and expect to find more of it. So they've found evidence of frog, but hopefully they'll find, you know, skull and, and parts of the rest of the body, which will be much more informative for naming a new species instead of naming it off of hips and then having to add on the other stuff later. That makes sense. Try to have a full picture before you have to go back and re-edit it anyway. It baffles me when I see, like, small frogs like that or teeny tiny little bugs with legs the width of my eyelash. Whenever I see, you know, small animals like that, I just baffle at, like, how can you fit muscles and organs in that teeny tiny body and not just, like, get crushed when I sneeze? The fact that we find fossils of those itty-bitty fragile animals is awesome. <laughs> I love that. And hopefully they'll the, this micro sorting will find other stuff. You know, there should the the most abundant animals in any ecosystem should not be the big ones. Exactly, that sediment should have early lizards and and uh, perhaps insect remains and tiny mammals or near mammals, lizards or near lizards, salamanders maybe things like that. So who knows what else they'll find? Yeah, we are macro biased. Yes, we are macro. <laughs> biotic bias well my next bit of news is a little bit bigger but it is about finding uh an interesting collection of things because it's a nesting site a fossil nesting site bird nesting site that recently has been discovered to not just be bird eggs oh this research this new research is by fernandez et al in scientific communications and the article we're linking to is by Darren Nash in his blog, Tetrapod Zoology. He was also part of this research team. Oh, cool. The original publication in the Science of Nature in 2012, when this fossil first came out, was describing it uh, because it was a collection of eggshells and some bone material, but mostly eggshells, fairly densely populated, as seems to be colonial nesting site of enantiornithine birds, which are Cretaceous birds. Their name means opposite birds because they've got weird skeletal anatomy compared to our modern birds. Yeah, they're the, the major group of birds from the Cretaceous. We talked about them in episode 37. Indeed. They are basically, they were that time period's version of most birds. Yes. They are all extinct, and a different branch of birds has taken over to be what you think of as birds, which is our modern birds today. They were the current hip thing back then. Yes, before it was cool to be a bird. Yes. Now, this collection of eggshells was found in Transylvania, Western Romania, and it includes eggshell fragments and crushed but complete eggs. They counted hundreds of eggs throughout this whole thing. And even though that, like I said, even though there are some bones, they said it's probably 70 to 80 percent eggshell for the mass of this little lump wow. that they removed. The recent bit of research looked at it and found that not all the eggshells are bird. There's a couple of other animals, eggs represented in this. The three are some sort of crocodilomorph, some geckoton lizard, and some other kind of bird, but not an antiornithine. Interesting. This really kind of shines a new light on it because originally they thought it was just a communal bird nesting site, like you see with, you know, certain gulls and albatross and stuff like that, where they have these, you know, penguins, massive nesting areas. Right, like a big colony. Yeah. This shifts it up a bit. When they looked at it, now, it's not like it's an equal representation. It's still 70% of those Cretaceous birds. Okay. So, still mostly what they thought it was, but there are a few others in there. The crocodilomorphs are the next most common. They said like 28% of it is 
the crocodilomorphs, and then less than two percent for the geckoitan lizards, and which is just the shell looks very similar to modern geckos, and it may even be part of the same group. And then some other bird, similar to modern bird shell, but they can't be sure what kind, and they can't tell what kind of crocodilomorph, so they don't know what animals laid these, but it's a different mixture than they expected, which first kind of undoes the just strict colonial uh, bird nesting. There's something else going on, and they offer some solutions. There are modern examples of different species nesting together. Uh, some of them are kind of cooperative. Some of them are semi-parasitic. Some of them are just convenient for one of the animals. Uh, one of the examples they used was turtles laying their eggs next to crocodilian nests. One of these animals, the gecko, for instance, they said could have been laying its eggs sneakily in the nests to have their eggs protected. Oh, uh, cool. Someone else has done the nesting work and you just drop your eggs in there? Yeah. Their South American geckos uh, will lay their eggs within cormorant and gull nests today, so this is not unheard of. Oh, that's cool. You could also see multiple species of bird nesting together, so that other bird may just be joining in on the fun. With the crocodilomorphs or the other bird, they may have just been not a problem, not threatening enough, so they just were okay to be nearby or part of the assembly. Yeah, if it was just a convenient place to lay your eggs and they didn't mind being near each other. Exactly. Or it could be geological. This area was a floodplain, so these could have been redistributed after flooding and the eggs moved and mixed together after their laying. So they may not have actually been laid in association. Uh, okay, so they're not necessarily what, what we call in situ, which is yes. to say in the position they were laid in, they may, may have been moved around. Absolutely. So they, they acknowledge that this is not a guarantee all these animals were living in harmony. They could have just been near each other, but it does suggest they were indeed near each other, that these were all living in proximity to each other, so it seems. Which, and I love this point, Darren Nash points out that the original artwork created for the location needs to be updated because, as I quote, they really should have at least a few more crocodilomorphs in view. <laughs> well, it's funny because as you were explaining this, that my thought was I like these discoveries because they lend credence to some really great art. Yes. That you can do this wonderful artwork of this colony of birds and then maybe a croc over here and a little lizard like sneaking in and out of some of the bird nests. It it, it paints a picture. I, I, I was talking to somebody the other day about, you know, you see all the this nature art, especially paleo art. And older artists really liked to do those scenes where there's like 20 different species in view yes, in the same place. And you look at it and you're like, oh, but that doesn't happen. Like I don't walk out into nature and see 20 animal species hanging out next to each other. But a nesting site, you actually could get these interesting overlaps, these interesting associations of different species, which yeah. is pretty cool. It's a nice little glimpse into what may have been a very interesting interaction between all these different species. Nice. Well, my next bit of news, if you thought that those frogs were tiny, my next news piece is about microscopic organisms, not fossil microscopic organisms. Keeping with the theme of today's episode, this is some laboratory experimentation. Oh. By Matthew Heron et al. in Scientific Reports. We'll link to an article on Science Alert by Fiona McDonald. Now, I don't want to oversell this one uh, too much, but these researchers uh, witnessed in the lab single-celled organisms evolve into multi-celled organisms. <laughs> I've seen this movie. So <laughs> it's a great movie. There's always time for lubricant. Now it's been a little while since biology class. How many cells does a single cell organism have? <laughs> One. <laughs> we know that several hundred million years ago, organisms evolved multicellular life for the first time, but we don't know why they evolved multicellular life. We don't know what factors promoted that development. One of the hypotheses is that it may have been driven by predation, that, uh. a, you know, the, a, a more dynamic food web or arrangement may have prompted some organisms, instead of getting larger, to group together. One way you can achieve this is by making a colony. 
you just gather in one place so that you have strength in numbers, sort of like a school of fish. But another way is to develop multicellular structures. These researchers raised five populations of a single-celled green algae species called Chlamydomonas reinhardt eye. Green algae, little plants, one cell each. And to f the five experimental populations, they added in paramecium, which is a filter-feeding predator. And they watched over the generations how the algae responded. In two of the populations, the algae developed multicellular structures. Wow. This happened over the course of 750 generations, which, for the algae, was 50 weeks. So <laughs> one year, from the start of the year to the end of the year, two populations observed multicellular structures that were not observed in the control populations. <whistles> now, in wild algae, this same species of algae, grouping is something that'll happen sometimes. You'll see the algae sort of group together, but this tends to be facultative which means they group together when it seems important and then they split apart you know when when they don't need to group here the the algae grouped together reproduced together and maintained their multicellularity for further generations in fact after the experiment was done the main phase of the experiment and the predators were removed the populations that evolved that developed the multicellular structures, kept them for another four years, just being kept in culture in the lab. Wow. They developed it and stayed that way. That's pretty stable. The researchers reported that there were variations in how many cells were in each cluster, in the particular life cycle of the multicellular groups, in the size of their propagules. Here's a vocabulary word that I just learned. <laughs> a propagule is the unit that you bud off of your body to develop more of you. In this case, they would, the final sort of most advanced stage they developed was you'd get a cluster of cells that all existed together, and then a bunch of cells would break off and give rise to another cluster. That's fascinating. It's super cool. And... Just, of course, to go back to the hypothesis, they found that the multicellular groupings did have lower rates of predation by the paramecium. So it was actually protecting them against being uh, eaten, fed upon. Yeah, it was functional. Yeah. So this lends major credence to the suggestion that multicellular traits could have developed in response to predation. That's really cool because it, if this pans out then that could suggest that multicellularity was prompted by predation and potentially things like evolution of eyes was prompted by the arms race and, and the Cambrian explosion uh, that followed them being able to chase each other after getting eyes. Like, predation being a really big factor. You su Sudden predation, you know, nothing was eating you, now something is. Nothing was chasing you, now something is. Being a trend in evolutionary history is really cool. That's yeah, really the world bad. as we know it is here because our ancestors were being eaten by things. Yes. <laughs> the authors point out that similar transitions have been observed in other single-celled organisms, in other experiments. So this is something that we've seen, not necessarily the same way or under the same conditions, but that a development of multicellular structures is something we've seen before and they made the really interesting point that as far as we know this particular algae does not have any multicellular ancestors oh that's cool so it's not like this is a species that has multicellularity in its past this is and the word they use the sciency word is a de novo development de novo <laughs> means an original development. They, it, a trait developed where there was previously no trait. Yeah, this is not something based on their ancestral history. They yep. are. This is new for their lineage. Evolved multicellularity. Way to go, algae. Cool. Yeah, good job. My next bit is not nearly as exciting and revolutionary as that, but it is cool. <laughs> but it's also fine. Mine is about Central America's oldest marine mammal, 
which is a tusked sea cow. <laughs> see, a sea pig. Yeah. <laughs> a sea pig is a different thing, actually. Yes. <laughs> that, was a, that was a Jim Gaffigan joke, but a sea pig is a different animal for, for scientific clarity. <laughs> I'm the manatee. <laughs> sea cow. This research is by Velez Huarbe and Wood in the Journal of Vertebrate Paleontology. And we'll be linking to the press release by Natalie Van Hoos on the Florida Museum website. This specimen was found by Stephen Manchester, who's the curator of paleontology at the Florida Museum. He and uh, a research field group was looking across the Panama Canal, up and down it along the sides for plant fossils, when they saw pieces of bone leading to a skeleton sticking out of the embankment. Classic story. Right. They started, they just saw like two or three vertebra and a few ribs started digging into the side and around a rock that it was near and found a fairly decent specimen that included skull, vertebra, ribs, and some other various bones. As they put it, they had to commence with emergency fossil excavation due to the rising waters of the canal. They found yeah. this at a particularly <laughs> low moment, and since the time that they excavated it, the water has since then eclipsed it, covered it, and he commented on the fact that this was probably a very rare chance they had to be able to get to that specimen. Yeah, right uh, place at the right time. This specimen is estimated to be about 20 million years old, which makes it the earliest evidence of a marine mammal on the Pacific side of the canal. And it belongs to a new genus and species of a dugong or dugong cousin called Culembrotherium alemni. The name is after the Culebra formation where they found it, and the species, the genus is after the formation. The species is af named after Alberto Elemen Zubita, who was the former chief executive officer of the Panama Canal, who helped them greatly during their field work. So that's cool. Yeah. This sea cow, or dugong, which they're both Cyrenians. Wait, the Culebra formation. Doesn't Culebra mean snake? It does. That's cool. I, I wonder if it's called that because it's by the river. Yeah, I don't the, know. The canal. I don't know. I'm sorry. There was a yeah. snake in your news and I, I had to point it I out. I knew I kept like pinging it when I was taking my notes, but I was too distracted <laughs> getting the notes down. That's what it was that I was like, why Snakes. does this sound so familiar? I, this is a new species, so it can't be familiar. There's yeah, that's a why. snake in your news. <laughs> This would have been back when it was still an ocean passage, not a connection between the continents. And this dugong, likely grazing on seagrasses like they do today, was tusked, which is not completely out of the norm for this group, living in what would have been warm coastal waters. It probably was like 15 feet long, which is a good size, but that's not unreasonable for this group either. They're big animals. And... The part that becomes impressive, though, is that it seemed to still be growing. Oh, neat. Yes. The newest molars in its mouth had only begun to protrude show and showed little wear, which indicated it still was maturing. And yeah, not yet full grown. Yeah. So when we were talking about the newest molars, manatees and dugongs have something awesome called marching molars, where they grow their molars from the back of the mouth, and then they slowly move forward in a big line, and as they wear down, they pop out the front, and new ones keep coming from the back like a conveyor belt, and them and elephants are the only ones that do it, and it's awesome. Yep, we actually know that the gray fossil site mastodon is not yet full grown for the exact same reason. Yay! Oh, that's cool. <laughs> this is good evidence that there was seagrass in this area 20 million years ago, and this is also interesting because... In the past, it was normal for there to be multiple species of dugong and manatees sharing an area, and that actually cultivated healthy seagrass beds. So if this one was sharing this area with other species, we would have expected similar habitat. Nowadays, we only have the one dugong, and that's unusual. They help promote healthy seagrass beds by chomping on the bigger grass and allowing the smaller grass a chance to grow. So this gives us a little insight into what the habitat in what was Panama looked like. It's always fun to see a thing like that that was common at one point and is weird to us now, like tusks on a manatee. Yeah. Like, that sounds weird to me because I live now. 
And I always like it's always fun when you can link the f- across the food web, and yes. you can say, well, because there were these creatures here, we can infer that there was seagrass. That's cool. You get multiple species identified, multiple types of organisms identified based on the discovery of just one. There's also a little bit of uh, funny irony to me that the dugong would have lived there when it was a seaway passage, and then that area closed up, and then we made a seaway passage and then found it there. Yes, that is <laughs> that is wonderful. I, I don't know. I like that. That's artistically, poetically nice. And that is going to wrap up our news. So at this point, we're going to be able to lead into our discussion after this brief break. So stick around. Stay tuned. So evolution as a concept most of us are familiar with, but since we're going to delve into the nitty gritty history of it, and we're going to only be able to get so nitty gritty because once again, we do not have all the time in the world. And there's yeah, a we're, we're going to squeeze several millennia into an hour. Whew. Yeah, there's a lot we could go over. So people who are listen, people who listen to the last episode are at home going <clears throat> an hour. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, we're certainly going to try. Yeah, I'm sure this is one of those where we're going to get to topics and people are like, oh, they didn't mention the coolest thing, that person. I, I'm sure we won't. I'm sure we won't. <laughs> but before we go into the nitty gritty history, let's define our term. Evolution is referring to evolutionary theory, the theory of evolution, which states in its core that all life on Earth shares a common ancestor and that the diversity and disparity, the many different kinds and forms that we see in life today is due to the gradual process of modifying inheritable traits, things that can be passed on from individual to individual through uh, mating or other forms of reproduction in the general population, in the populations of those animals, passing those on throughout time. This is summed up in the phrase descent with modification. Yes. That common descent that we Indeed. all share an ancestry modification that things change through generational time. And so that's, this is how we know it today. And this is a concept that people have toyed with for a while. Now, evolution can happen in small scale and large scale. Small scale would be changing in a gene, change in the frequency of a gene within a population from one generation to the next. And on the larger scale would be changing of a species from an ancestor to a new species. Or even a new genus or a new family or exactly. a new order and so on. So you you can you can look at this on the population level all the way down to the cellular level. So lots of different ways to look at this, which is why it's such a complex topic. There are a lot of moving parts to it. It's also why it's such a grand, incredible theory. It's It's very much in the same way that gravitation was exciting because... Newton found an equation, one equation that described pretty much all of the movement of objects relative to each other in the universe. Like, hey, this one mathematical equation describes all of the motions of the planets and stars and the movement of the Earth and all that stuff. Evolutionary theory explains just about all of the diversity and history that we see in organisms on planet Earth. Yes. In modern biology, the concept of evolution is core to ex- how we explain the natural world. There, There is no aspect of biology nowadays that does not tie back to it. So where did it come from? Where did we get this wacky idea? Who did this? This, this kooky concept. Well, we've been, and by we, I mean the human race, we've been batting around this idea or ones parallel to it, you know, maybe not evolution, but things dealing with it for literally centuries, uh, thousands of years, even you can go far, far, far back and find people who are touching the edges of it. One person that you'll see pop up quoted to be the father of the theory of evolution is Al Jahiz in 776 
A.D. Whew. Going a little ways back. Yeah. This was a man who was a, 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 a thinker, wrote a number of you know works on different concepts. The one we're going to focus on is his work, The Book of Animals. He was believed to be of Ethiopian descent, uh, an African Arab. He wrote on multiple concepts dealing with biology and zoology. This is, this is one of the, the, the famous early works that is starting to look at animals from a, a critical point of view. You know, how are they actually functioning? Why are they doing what they're doing? Even things like animal classification, food chains, and dealing with aspects of evolution. Not dealing with it, but dealing with things that deal with it. Right, early stages. You're going to notice that as a trend as we start this conversation. We do not jump onto the concept. We have to flit around the edges of it because there's a lot of ideas that settle in earlier than evolution that actually, even though they're dealing, and they're working in that direction, actually end up barring the way. So that happens a lot with this concept. We will come up with an idea that is getting us close, but then we actually get stuck on later. So he was not considering animals changing, but he was noticing why animals did what they did. He was he would describe animal mimicry, noticing that certain parasites would be the color of their host. He would even describe uh, the influences of climate on the diet of animals, plants, and even people. And that different geological regions had effects on these living things. So was noticing that they seem to be different depending on what they eat and why they eat it and where they live. You know, that there's not just cow here, cow there, cow over here. There's a difference. Uh, one of the ones that I, I thought was really cool is co he even commented on the communication and psychology and even intelligence of certain animal groups, particularly a very detailed description of the social organization of ants. Oh, that's fun. Yeah. He, he noticed that they stored grain in their nests so that it did not spoil during the rainy season and was Ooh. keyed into that's that's smart. Like That's not just animal being an animal. That's clever. <laughs> How fun to imagine. Like nowadays you say ants and we all know that ants are incredible and that they do all these wonderful things. How cool to have been the earliest people to look at them and go, but these ants have a colony and they're they're taking stuff back to their home. Like what what a remarkable discovery that would have been to oh, and to connect. That's like, well, they're living in a society and we live in one of those. Hmm. Like that's a connection that takes a little bit of uh, abstract thinking to get to. And we should remind our listeners that this, you know, these days, again, adaptation is sort of an obvious thing that we're all very familiar with. And the the right the, the extended history of the world and that there were these, you know, past times with ancient organisms and stuff. These days is common knowledge everywhere. But back then, you know, and for for mo like by far most of human history, it was not known that our modern time was preceded by ancient eras. It was not understood that animals adapted to their environments. People just looked around and said, that's an animal, that's an animal, that's an animal. And now we're seeing the beginnings of these questions of, okay, but why are they the, the way that they are and where they are? And part of the reason we were so stuck in that mentality of animals are just animals or animals are just the way they are is because of a concept known as the great chain of being. So we must go back even earlier to three to the three hundreds BC in the before times. Indeed. We're talking about Aristotle here. I've heard of that guy. Aristotle, great Greek philosopher and scientist often considered the father of Western philosophy, kind of a big deal. A little bit. He created something that became known as Aristotle's Scala Natura, which is the scale of nature. This was a theory often associated with him and Plato, another philosopher, that classified all living organisms, all categories of living things and some non-living in a hierarchy, kind of a ladder system, with the bottom being simplistic, less complex organisms and beings and as you moved up they got increasingly more 
elevated, increasingly co more complex, and eventually capped off with the pinnacle of nature, us humans. So Naturally. Aristotle said. Absolutely. Yes. Figures a human would say that. Yes. <laughs> it's, it's the, the, it just sounds like a line from a sci fi movie. It's, oh, <laughs> sounds like humans. Well, because if flamingos had made the Scala Natura, then flamingos would be at the top of it. They'd been like, L how could something with legs like that be advanced? <laughs> now, to give you a brief breakdown, at the very bottom were inorganics minerals, rocks stones, things like that. Right. Just above that were plants. And there was a whole idea that each level had dominion over the one before it. Plants could get nutrition from the rocks. Lower animals could get nutrition from plants. And those would include things like sponges and, you know, non-active animals. And some of these are not going to, you know, there's going to be lots of things in these categories that wouldn't be categorized that way today, obviously. But lower animals, vertebrates like fish, then higher animals, which usually included mammals, mostly. Monkeys and apes, which is interesting. Yeah. And then at the top, humans. So the reason I bring this up is because this is going to act as a background framework to a lot of the concepts we come along later on. This is a really stubborn idea. Yeah, it's still in, it gets in the way today. Absolutely. Even today, you will see it both. It, it's lingering in science. You'll hear people refer to fish and reptiles and amphibians as the lower vertebrates. Yes. And then mammals and birds are the higher vertebrates, which is a holdover from this idea. And people have a really, just people in general have a really hard time letting go of this notion that there is some sort of organization of superiority to nature that certain organisms are better are superior are more evolved you'll hear people yes. say more evolved all the time even though that doesn't make any sense like th this notion that you can rank people uh, among other organisms like you would rank you know uh, athletes in terms of their ability in in their sport and and this this has been very core not just to science but to human civilization this was taken as kind of the assumed reality from that time all the way through the middle ages in many cultures around the world you it was just assumed that the world had an order and everything had a place in it especially after christianity started to grow in power and notoriety divine beings were added to the ladder with angels above humans and God at the top. Uh. And now the position of humans was not just the top of nature, but the bridge between the spiritual and the natural world. Right, the closest to the divine. We were part spiritual. We had a soul, but we were also of nature. We ate and we fed and we grew. This is something that will come up later because this is something that was very hard for certain people to let go of, that we were not somehow separate from the rest of the ladder. You know, this elevated us above. And this has some ne negative side effects because it also means that it disconnects us. You know, for a lot of people, this disconnects us from the environment. We're seen as not part of the ecosystem. And that that is something that can has caused a lot of trouble with just us and how we treat the ecosystem. See episode 55. Indeed. So one of the things this led to was the idea of creationism. Now, creation myths are something that every culture has. How did the world come to be? It was on the back of a turtle. It was formed by our deities. It was, you know, always there and then life was put on it. There's lots of versions. Uh, some of them, it was the ocean and then land was the creation of the world. You know, it was a vast ocean and then land was sculpted or dug up by the animals. There's lots of versions. This one is one that gets tied in very nicely with the great chain of being, which is part of how it gets connected. But in this, we see a date pop up. And so you probably already know what I'm talking about. In the 17th century, a Anglican archbishop named James Usher went through the Bible and counted all the generations that were listed and added them to the current modern history at that time. And described a date for the age of earth i think that if i remember correctly he actually 
did, it was more than just the one scripture. He went to different scriptural texts and linked up events. Yeah, like yeah. Mm-hmm. These two scriptures describe this eclipse or something. And link it was actually very detailed work. It took years and years. This guy, it was, it was very stratigraphic. It was very yes, much yes. like correlating events in history and like a huge undertaking. He wasn't the only one to do it, but his is the famous, this huge undertaking that allowed him to put together this estimated timeline of human history and thus Earth history. And he came out to that Earth was about 6,000 years old and brought it to the date, beginning of Earth, of October 23rd. 4004 BC. The night, I believe. Yes. Or, or the morning. Like, it specifically is... It, yeah, it goes down to, like, the hour. The hour. Yeah, I forget what it is. I, I can't remember it which hour it starts at the was. morning or the night. I bring up these because this is going to backlight the rest of the conversation. This is how we viewed the world for a long, long time. Everything in it had an order. Everything in it was the way it was by design. And in some cases, by design of God or some other divine force. And in some cases, they were put there for a reason. These animals had lessons to teach us because of where they were. The humble mouse, the mighty lion, had morals and virtues to portray. That's what Aesop's fables very much builds off of. You know, mighty and lowly animals. And this also portrayed... This also... uh bled over into social structure. This is what the divine right to rule came from. That kings were kings because God said so. You were a beggar because God said so. You were a peasant because God said so. To step out of those roles was to go against God. Right. That It wasn't just ordering of creatures. It was ordering of people. Yes. To, to various uh, awful side effects. This is, this is a very similar mentality that led us to eugenics later on when genetics started to become popular is that you could define worth in people in a clear cut way. This was the core. This was how we viewed things for a good while. Even as we started to make efforts toward redefining nature, we still, this was at the core of many of those views. When we go into the 17th and 18th century, we're still seeing things as fixed. And you, you'll hear that term a lot, fixity, that things were fixed in their place. Yes, immutable. Yes. Unchanging. They were not changing. But people were starting to try to figure out how do we describe them? How do we uh, learn about them? We still want to examine them and understand them. We're just not expecting them to change. Enter in Carolus Linnaeus in 1707 to 1776. This is a Swedish botanist of some fame. He was a physician and zoologist as well, and is known as the father of modern taxonomy. Yeah, you know him from biology class. Linnaean taxonomy. This is where we get into binomial nomenclature. Now, Linnaeus was extremely active as a a naturalist and zoologist. He wrote some odd 180 books filled with descriptions of plants and animals. And this is where we're getting into, we're starting to get into scientific descriptions. We're still not describing them changing, but we're analyzing them as they are. Did little interpretation, because uh, apparently he still thought he was just unlocking, uh, revealing the unchanging order of life that God had already created. So he was not trying to unwrap these organisms, but just describe them just to under just to say this is how it is to order all of this he needed a classification system so he came up with binomial nomenclature this is the process of giving two latin names to an organism a genus and a species to describe that organism homo sapiens tyrannosaurus rex all of those names that that's why they're two parts by two nomial and nomenclature meaning they're naming so Binomial name, binomial, two names. It's a little redundant. What Nomenclature is, yeah. is yeah. a naming system. Two that's named all... naming system is, is essentially what it means. Thank you. Yeah. I, I, that's why I was getting confused because I'm like, two name name? Two name it's name. Your, it's your two name name, which is also technically correct, just awful. ATM machine. This is not the first time this concept was uh, suggested. The concept of genus and species had, had been used before. Uh, John Ray was an English naturalist in the 1600s that 
developed the concept of genus and species, but did not did not develop a naming system with it. So that's a lot of these people did not come up with everything from scratch. They put it into an organized tool we could use. He proposed this in his uh, System Natura, which is the system of nature in 1735, small pamphlet that was explaining the system and classified a number of species. He published multiple editions and throughout them named 4,400 animal species and 7,700 plant species. And those, most of those names we still use today. Yes. Like he named us. Homo sapien yep. was one of those names that he used, that he named during this time. So this, the wise men is what that means, by the way. This is a crucial part because now we can start organizing nature. And he also made his own hierarchy to put it within. Still, he is a little Aristotelian. He's still great chain of being mentality. But this is what we base our classification off of now. Now, his was a little different. He had kingdoms, and then those were divided into classes, order, genus, species, or genera. Kingdom, species. phylum, class, order, family, genus, species, just like biology class. Indeed, but he did not have the phylum yet, and he did not have family yet. Oh. He had a few less. And the kingdoms were where you broke up animals, plants, and minerals. Minerals being all non-living things. So a little different than us. We and we still it. use that too. When you start a game of 20 questions, you say yes. animal, vegetable, or mineral. Even though that's a terrible way of d dividing things in the world. I've always been like, how many, th how many people are naming minerals? Like, who's out <laughs> there? <laughs> that always baffled me. Nowadays, we have three domains. Archaea, bacteria, eukarya. And then in Eukarya, we have the kingdoms of animalia, fungi, planta, so on and so forth. Then phyla, the phylums, then class, order, family, genus, species. And they're nested. Each, each smaller category fits within the category above it so that there is a like a, a babushka doll. A, yes. A, a nesting system, which is very important. That was something that he used is he classified them relative to uh, relative to how similar they were to each other and this is the core of classification and taxonomy how similar are you compared to you and you all right then you two to go together and you're off on your own because you're weird and he wasn't asking why they're similar mm -mm. just categorizing them he had a bunch of stuff and he needed boxes to put them in. <laughs> Which humans are just so good at doing. I I named over 10,000 species. <laughs> I need to put them somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> so moving forward with this, we start to see some cracks in the Great Chain. As we get into the late 18th century, the late 1700s, I've always found that a weird thing. If the 1700s yeah, well, is the 18th Because the zeros century. are the first yeah, century, yeah, yeah. and then it's, yeah, I know. As we enter in the end of this century, we start to see some scientists who, as one of my sources put it, quietly suggest that life forms are not fixed. Now, most of these were not outright saying it, but they would suggest it. They couldn't really outright say it because they would have been rebuked. But you start to hear it. George Louis Leclerc Comet de Buffon, or as you'll usually see it just as Buffon, was a French mathematician and naturalist. He was a early advocate of Linnaean taxonomy and started using it. And he did suggest that things could change through time and suspected that it was somehow connected to the environment, maybe chance. So you can see where we're going with this. I think that it's important to note that we are now in the 1700s, and it is finally during that century that scientists started to come around to the idea of extinction. Yes, exactly. And he was one of the ones that helped us relook at the history of Earth during this time. He did still think that life developed in distinct types, so they were already categorized when they originated and there was some sort of internal mold that defined those types but during migrations which is a big idea for a lot of these early scientists that animals moving was one of the main causes of the things we saw as they 
move from place to place, the environment would change, which means the organic particles that would make up that internal mold, is how he put it, would the source of your organic particles would change because you're in a new place, so it's not the same stuff, which could potentially change the mold of the organism. Interesting. A sort of proto-evolution. Eh. Yes. Yeah, so kind of, <laughs> kind of adaptation, <laughs> but it's it's that you're being you're it sounds like you're made of different things. Yes. I've moved to the forest and now I am made of forest things. Yeah, and that's kind of what he was getting at. Now, the big thing that he did is he did put forth that Earth was older than six thousand years Ooh. and in a really cool way. He used the brand spanking new physics of Sir Isaac Newton and conjectured that the matter of the solar system and Earth could have been formed through natural means via physics. Whoa, that's a big deal to say that something could have happened by itself through natural means. Just like when Newton was like, all right, hey, no one's pushing the planets around. It's a natural process. That's an important step. And that happens a couple of times here where people go, hey, I think this could happen on its own. And slowly breaking it away from there having to be a system that it was put in, but that the system is secondary to those things. He proposed that a comet might have striked the sun and broken a piece off, broken off debris, that then would have formed the planets of the solar system. Now, we all know that there's nothing to hit in the sun now. Right. The sun is a massive incandescent gas. But back then, it, it was another round thing in the sky. <laughs> <laughs> yes, they, hadn't, they hadn't gotten a whole lot into astronomy in that sense just yet. Now, this is where I think it gets really cool. He said that initially, the Earth would have been scorching hot and gradually cooled until the molten rock turned to dry land and clouds rained down to form the ocean. Yep. That's crazily close yeah that's not a bad you're not too far off (laughs) that's just using pure logic and the concept of physics worked out and suggested speculated in about 1774 that earth must be at least 75,000 years old now we're still not at 4.6 billion Right. But we've increased by a factor of 10. And that was, if I remember right, correct me if I'm wrong, it was how long it would have taken to cool down. Yes. That he, and I, I think some others were say, was suggesting if the Earth started out hot, which they were correct about, at least mm-hmm. in part, <laughs> how long would it take to cool enough to be what it is today? And what's notable is that the big reason why that doesn't work is because the Earth creates its own internal heat through the radioactive decay of minerals, of, 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 of certain elements, which that same process is also what has given us our modern way methods of calculating the age of rocks, which is a, a delightful little irony. Buffon was so close to being on the money. It's crazy. And this bumps us a step forward into how do we perceive the earth adding more time allows us to think up new ways that life might be functioning in 6,000 years. There's not a lot of time for stuff to happen, but in 75,000 years or more, now we have some time to play around with. So it's opening doors. It's opening potential for brainstorming. This is also a time period where this is around the time that paleontology is really becoming a thing. Indeed. So we're just on the cusp of science starting to go, oh, hey, there used to be things here. Yes. And things have changed. The life we know is not all the life that there has been. Yes. Now, he also did believe that life could spontaneously come into being. Very common idea at the time. Very common. This was known as spontaneous, or is known now more accurately, as spontaneous generation. And this was a concept that in... Certain situations, if just the right scenario was put together, and depending on who had the idea, it was very specific or very vague, life could pop into being from non-living matter. Yeah, maggots would just appear in meat, and mice would just appear in piles of hay or grain or something. Yes. The maggots in the meat and bacteria, you know, mold on stuff 
was some of the big ones because I, I put it in the cooler box or I put it in the salt room and I locked the door. Yeah. I, the key's right here, guys. I've had it with me all night. <laughs> I've been looking at this bread. Nothing has touched this bread. Look! And now there's <laughs> stuff living on it. So that idea, which is kind of interesting because it's getting toward, it's kind of getting toward a evolution-minded idea. It's obviously false by today's knowledge, but it's still a natural solution for the origination of life. Yeah, you're, 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 it's sort of taking a step past the uh, individual creation that that all animals were placed here and now it's saying oh animals can just pop it's a natural process that achieves the same thing that individual species are just appearing and once again buffon impresses he suggested that in the hot oceans of early earth vast amounts of life were generated from the unorganized matter well done buffon (laughs) now he says even large animals Sprang right, into right. existence at that point. Whales. So it would have been like <laughs> microbe, plankton, whale, yeah. dolphin. <laughs> yeah. Swimming up out of a hydrothermal <laughs> vent. <laughs> and then as things cool, this is where it gets interesting because this is them trying to explain the fossil record. As things cooled, he thought many of those animals moved to the tropics. And this was because looking in the fossil record, they found elephants in Siberia and North America. But Uh, during the day, they were only found in Africa and South Asia. How funny to look at an elephant in Siberia and go, oh, it must have been warmer back then. Yes. Where now we know it was the exact opposite. At least the famous mammoths in Siberia were during the exact opposite. But it's, (laughs) it's that concept of, okay, there were obviously elephants here at one time. These must have just been the ones who didn't survive the trip to the tropics. These are not a different kind of elephant. They just were the ones who didn't make it. We've all made long trips and, you know, not <laughs> everyone distribu- makes it. We've all died of dysentery. Yes. The distribution of organisms has changed and a dramatic thing to realize. So we're getting there. This is a brief side. He didn't, he wasn't like a huge, huge player like Buffon, but he was there. Erasmus Darwin. What? The Not grandfather. Charles Darwin. No, the grandfather of Charles Darwin. Who had a cooler name. Yes, he did. Erasmus. He was a physician, a poet, and amateur scientist. He did make some comments showing that he believed change in life had occurred, including in us humans. Very fuzzy concepts. Never put down a you know, set idea for it. But there is a quote from him saying that for the life that we see on Earth, it must have been evolving for millions of ages before the commencement of the history of mankind. Whoa. That's big. That's a that's a big statement. Yeah. That's bold. Now, a lot of these people publish a lot of this stuff kind of anonymously. Yeah. <laughs> because if you know your family when you go to a family reunion are... All staunch fans of not your sports team, you don't wear your sports jersey. It's yes, <laughs> you don't. You don't. I I couldn't think of a rivalry. Uh, yeah, right. Sports team versus other sports team. <laughs> if you're going to the Capulet Ball, you don't wear the Montague M. Uh, There's some sports teams for you. This was the beginnings of our evolutionists. Yes, we get our first true concept, proposed concept of evolution with Jean-Baptiste Lamarck. Lamarck, as he's typically known, because his full name is Jean-Baptiste Pierre Antoine de Monet Chevalier de Lamarck. Chevalier. 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 That's much better. That's French. Jean-Baptiste Pierre Antoine de Monet Chevalier de Lamarck. Or so Lamarck. Lamarck, yeah. <laughs> oh, we'll call him Lamarck. So Lamarck. De Monet. <laughs> <laughs> Lamarck for short? Cool. Lamarck for short. He was born in 1744 and lived to 1829. He is a French naturalist, protégé of Buffon, so you can see the connection. He was a biologist, an academic, a soldier as well, which is interesting. Had a full, full life. Early proponent that life had evolved, that evolution had occurred, and that it proceeded via natural laws. Now, at the time, they did not call it evolution. They nope. called the, the common term uh, that would come about was transmutation, which uh, was coined in one of his publications. Oh, 
and so very heavily connected to him. So that's, I believe his publication was the first time we saw it coined. So they were called transmutationists. Now he had a wide career. He coined the term invertebrate and was the first to use the term biology in its modern sense. So like he was sciencing all over the place, but his main uh, achievement that he's known for is proposing a system of evolution. Now, it's not the system we use today, and it's often kind of mocked today, which isn't fair. Because not totally, no. He put forward a solid idea, turned out to be wrong, but it was still very crucial in moving us forward. And it was eventually, was what eventually inspired Charles Darwin as he came up with his theory of evolution. So Lamarck noticing the, at this point, as David mentioned, very notable collection of fossil material that paleontologists had collected by this point was convinced that the world could not be unchanging. It's, it is, that is just too much evidence that things were different and therefore life could not be fixed. So how was it changing? And he proposed what we now know as Inheritance of Acquired Characteristics. Now, this was not the only thing he proposed, and it was actually not even the main thing he focused on when he uh, published and presented a lot of these, but it's the thing we all remember for. This was, once again, not his original idea, not uh, the first time we had seen this idea. The first time we ever saw something that was akin to this idea was actually back in the 4th century BC by Hippocrates. Hippocrates. I know, but Hippocrates. <laughs> <laughs> Hippocrates. That's where you keep your hippos. Uh, Hippocrates suggested a very similar concept that that is in line with Lamarck's suggestion that as animals in, interact with their environment and either use or neglect a body part or feature or characteristic, using it will increase it in size, in prominence, in complexity, and not using it, disuse, will shrink it, make it go away, or diminish it. reduce it, diminish it. Uh, Hippocrates said a similar thing about like people binding their kids' heads to elongate their forehead. He thought that eventually nature would reinforce that. So this idea has been around for a while. Lamarck put it into a very organized thought, or a very organized system. The famous example everyone gives is giraffes stretching for plants and getting longer necks every generation, and that as they get a longer gener neck, they're actually able to pass on that longer neck to their young. That, that That is inheritable. Even though I'm pretty sure Lamarck didn't really lean on that very much. No. I feel like I read somewhere that he mentioned that idea once as like a minor thing, but that's the one that caught on. The one that he used was things like wading birds stretching their legs to stay out of the water. Yes. And this one I loved, blindness in moles. That's that's a cool observation to make. Yeah, you're spending your time underground, not using your eyes. Why do you need them? And they go away. So you can see this is, he's connecting the right dots. Yeah. Animals interacting with their environment affect their anatomy. And the traits that they need or don't need are changing over time because they need or don't need them. Now, he's got the he's got the order backwards. He's saying that because I don't need this, it goes away. It's that the animals themselves are driving their own evolution. You know, yes. That they are attempting to do something and they are becoming better at it each generation. So he's connecting the dots, but he's flipping it. This still had a great... Ma a a great chain mentality to it because he also was prominent on, and this was one of his bigger parts of the theory that he focused on, is that not only could things change each generation, but it would always be toward an increasingly complex set of forms. That evolution always worked its way up the chain of complexity. So it's still a little set in that we are improving over time all the time. Yeah, stuck in the past. Still believed in spontaneous generation and thought that simple life could generate. Not complex life, but simple life could from inanimate materials. And then those would transmute into gradually and progressively more complex forms. So That's interesting. 
We're getting that picture. <laughs> We're slowly getting there. The the system is just flipped a bit. Now, he did not become well known for this hypothesis during his time. He was actually, for many, this was considered a very appalling idea because it was a natural process, not a religious process. And for those who still he held that the system of nature that we are describing is a system of nature put there by God, he was kind of shunned by many of these people. And even other scientists of the time actively attacked his ideas right away. And in fairness, in some of the, the for those people, it, he also didn't have a very good suggestion of mechanism. No, he was like, wrong. <laughs> he was wrong. Yeah, exactly. He was wrong. His his inheritance of acquired characteristics doesn't quite work. And so people were, you know, well, you're trying to change up how we think about stuff, but you, it's not very convincing. So once again, to quote one of the sources I found, Lamarck died in 1829 in poverty and obscurity. Poor little fella. And once again, he's kind of, we kind of use him as like, oh, wacky Lamarck. But considering he was the first one to ever put forward a system of evolution. At least one that stuck around. At least one that, that became sort of prominently used later on. Well, it was the, the first major published written down, here's how I think it worked in detail. Yes, it was wrong. But he was more right than, uh, than, than everybody else. And this breaks the ice. Now it's out. Trans transmutation is out there to be discussed. And some people didn't like it. Cuvier was one of the major scientists who attacked him, and we will talk about him in a moment. So at almost the exact same time as Lamarck, George Cuvier was a French zoologist and statesman who was also doing research into the organization and functioning and history of life and actively attacking Lamarck's hypothesis. He was not a fan. He staunchly believed life was fixed did not like the inheritance of acquired characteristics and showed it to be incorrect by claiming if it were true, for instance, the thing, things like the children of cowboys who have bow legs from riding horses should show bowed legs <laughs> and weightlifters should give birth to stronger babies within large muscles. But we don't see any of that. It's pretty easy, pretty easy to pull the legs out from under Lamarck's hypothesis. It was not very hard to go... Yeah, but we don't see that. Like Now, in fairness to Lamarck, there was a lot more to his hypotheses than that. Yes. But the the, the point remains that yeah, you know, his ideas were, were indeed incorrect. And like as I point that was not even the core aspect of Lamarck's what what he was trying to pr promote. But that's the one everyone was focusing on, because that was the one that's saying life could change. And it was putting out a system of how it did it. So Cuvier attacked that, but even though he was attacking evolution, he was denying it and saying that life did not change, he actually was still very helpful in other ways, very com complex views. He acknowledged that there were earlier life forms because he was one of the first scientists to truly identify extinction of ancient animals. Uh, he was an anatomist. And he had done dissections. He had he also was a big part in establishing comparative anatomy as a field by dissecting and comparing the forms of life forms of of animals. But he also reconstructed fossil skeletons and saw that these these animals obviously weren't around. Like th this is nothing that exists today. So. Definitely things have gone extinct. And even notice that in deeper strata, lower layers, the fossils of the animals there were less similar than those in higher stratas, in the more recent layers. Uh, that the closer you got in geologic time, the more similar things became. So he, he owned up. Absolutely. Things have gone extinct. But that doesn't mean they changed. 
Yes, he was very staunch. <laughs> no change. Yes. Just so extinction. Was not convinced. Still believed things were fixed and that things had specific uh, uh, anatomical designs that they were grouped within. He still promoted a recent beginning of Earth, a short lifespan, but was impressed with the amount of change that had happened in that time, which drove him to promote the concept of catastrophism. Catastrophism is the idea that Earth is the way it is due to sudden and violent geological natural events. Yeah, that things are the same all the time, except for these big, dramatic phenomena. A volcano ripping a landscape apart. An earthquake redistributing the landmass. A flood washing over. These concepts were... This was the concept that he promoted for how Earth had come to be the way it is, citing Noah's flood as one of the most recent and dramatic of these effects. Yeah, it's easy to sell like an idea, a catastrophic sense of history, when the most prominent philosophy in the Western world has a global flood story as part of its its core foundation. Yes, and he believed that this was part of the cause for those extinctions, was that we were not seeing change in life, but we were seeing a bunch of animals, and then suddenly a bunch of them would be wiped out. And the reason we would see new animals in an area was not evolution, but animals moving into the area of def devastation after the event. So migration, once again, kind of trying to be a way to explain. Well, we know animals can move around. Maybe that's what's causing all of this. He did not stand unchallenged. Charles Lyell was a lawyer and geologist, an English geologist, who, while examining the geological layers, disagreed staunchly that things were not happening in dramatic leaps and bounds, but slowly and in progressive changes. This was the idea, and once again, neither of these people came up with these ideas, but they were the champions of them. They were pushing these forward. Right, the public face. Yes. Uniformitarianism is the idea that the processes affecting Earth now are the same they have always been and are f happening at effectively the same rate. This is also known as gradualism. Yes, you, the, the, the processes are uniform. They have always been as they are. The quote you often see with this one is that the present is the key to the past. The same sort of erosion that we see today, right, in a week, clearing a little channel on a mountain over the generations could completely get rid of a mountain. So these two were at war for a long, long time. And people were pretty fond of the catastrophism mentality. That, that was a very popular idea. It wasn't until later that century that people started accepting gradualism and rejecting the catastrophic mentality. This was important because this is what leads us to Darwin, because this idea of gradual progression yeah. opened the door for good old Charlie Darwin to present the concept of natural selection. 1809, Charles Darwin is born. In 1859, he publishes on the origin of species. The origin of species of note, not the origin of life. No. The origin of species from other species. This yes. is a common misconception, I see. Absolutely. He, this is him describing how does one species become another species. And it is through the mechanism of natural selection, also conceived of by Alfred Russell Wallace. If you want to learn more about those two guys, check out our episodes on the two of them. 28 and 54. This concept became known as Darwinism, or Darwinian theory, and it stated, and this is going to sound familiar, that all species arise and develop through the natural selection of inherited variations that increase the indi individual's ability to compete, survive, and reproduce, and that all life descended from a common ancestor. This conveniently explains just about all of the things that those other people were pointing out. This really fills in those blanks. It explains why Linnaean taxonomy works so well to categorize organisms by their similarity. It explains why organisms seem to group into that hierarchical nesting thing that all mammals fit within mammalia. 
It explains what Cuvier pointed out, that species that are closest to us in geologic time are the most similar. It explains how more recent species have taken over in favor of older species. It explains what Wallace pointed out, that different species are very similar in close geographic location to each other. This idea was a big one. This this is a game changer. And it was built on four basic tenets. That more individuals are produced each generation than can survive. That your ecosystem does not provide enough for everyone that is born to survive. That phenotypic, your physical characteristics, variation in those exists among those individuals and that that variation is heritable. It can be passed on to the next generation. Those individuals with heritable traits better suited to the environment are more likely to survive and that uh, reproductive isolation, when that occurs, a new species will form. Too many organisms in the environment. Everyone's different. The traits that allow you to survive will favor you in that competition. You will pass those traits on to your offspring. And if you're grouped off by yourself while you're doing that, your group can become different. New species. Evolution. This is a big deal. It's actually highly inspired by Lamarck. Darwin used a lot of the same evidence that Lamarck used in to form his hypothesis. Things like vestigial structures, that losing a trait does definitely happen. Uh, artificial selection was a big eye-opener for both of them, that we can change an animal by selecting for traits. And so these were big aspects for both of these ideas. He didn't go along with all of Lamarck's ideas, obviously. He did not, and this is this is a big shift from everyone up till now, did not follow, as they say, the arrow of complexity. He did not think that everything is constantly getting more complex. He argued that the complexity of an organism was evolved as a result of the adaptations to its conditions. So they only became complex because of what they were adapting to. If you didn't need to become a complex, you didn't. And now it's passive. The change is being driven not by the organisms, but by the environment. So we we flipped. Organisms are reacting to their surroundings. And this is really, really big. Now, he was not perfect on all fronts. No. The one main thing where Darwin fell short to no fault of his own, because none of us, almost none of us, knew the answer to this question, <laughs> was how are these variations passed on? How are they inherited? I know that they are. Blonde hair parents have blonde hair kids. But how is that moving from their head to their head? Darwin had some ideas, but ultimately, like like almost everyone else of the time, didn't know. He went through a lot of ideas and rejected a bunch of them. He even tried out the inheritance of acquired characteristics and found it unsatisfying. He did, though, promote one idea that has stuck around, which is called pangenesis. And this was an idea that there are things in your body that he called gemules that when your body reacts to its environment and variation is formed, that a change happens in your body due to interacting or some other cause, those gemules from that change, when you go to mate, move to your reproductive cells and can be passed on to your offspring. And the gemules of the two parents are blended together, like mixing paints. And you get a fusion of the two sets of variations. This blending was the most popular answer for this form of inheritance at the time, is that somehow the traits were blending. And even he acknowledged that one of the issues with blending is that eventually this would blend all the variations and natural selection would no longer have anything to work off of. So like, if we were truly just blurring the lines every time, eventually it would completely blur and it would just all be gray. So it's not a great answer, but it's the answer that was proposed and that we kind of had to work off of for a while until we rediscovered the works of Gregor Mendel. Gregor Mendel, alive at the same time as Darwin, 
and coming up with his ideas same time as Darwin, just nobody cared. Yeah, no one noticed. Actually answered this question. Gregor Mendel was a monk in the Czech Republic. He had been trained in mathematics and uh, grew pea plants in the monastery. And whilst doing that, his curiosity was piqued as he noticed certain traits of the pea plants seem to only occur in limited forms. And he noticed a number of them that only occurred in two forms, that you only ever got pea plants with purple or white flowers of the variety he was working with. And this piqued his curiosity, so he decided to run a statistical analysis. A real classic scientific experiment. Because of his training in mathematics, he was able to apply a what we would consider s normal scientific approach. And he looked through the pea plants and noted seven traits. Flower color, purple or white. Flower position, axial, which is on the side of the stem or terminal on the end of the stem. Stem length, long or short. Pod shape, inflated or constricted. Pod color, yellow or green. Seed color, yellow or green. Or seed shape, round or wrinkled. And he did some breeding. What he would do is he would breed one generation with opposite traits and observe the outcome for the offspring. And what he noticed in many of these, uh, in these seven, was that, for instance, when he bred white-flowered and purple-flowered pea plants, the first generation, F1 generation, as we now would know uh, when it comes to crossbreeding, were all purple-flowered. When he bred that generation with itself, self-fertilized the F1 generation to get an F2 generation, he got three-quarters purple flower, one quarter white flower. Both of these results were very revealing because it concluded a couple of things. One, it's not a blending. Nope. No light purple flowers. <laughs> no like splotchy calico flowers. No kind of wrinkly seeds. Yep. It was either one trait or the other. Now, People have pointed out since then that he was very lucky at the traits he picked and at the plant he picked, because not all <laughs> organisms work this yeah. way, and not it was all very traits. But I wonder how many monks tried the same experiment, and it was just <laughs> ridiculous. And they were like, "Ah, there's nothing to be found here." He actually, he actually did retry it again with uh, another plant, hawkweed, and failed because the genetics of hawkweed are weird. <laughs> so he actually that did happen to him. He was like, "All right, I'll recreate it." Nothing. Nope. Nothing's working. <laughs> nope. Only pea plants. <laughs> Concluded they're not blending and that traits are individual and behave differently. He came up with what now is known, what now are known as Mendel's laws. The laws of segregation of genes. This is saying that while a gamete is formed, a egg or sperm cell, the alleles, which are the different traits, so the two different versions of colored or wrinklingness or whatever, same spot in the DNA, but two different options can be separated from each other. Because when you make an egg or a sperm cell, you split the DNA of your cell in half. Half of it goes to one, half of it, you know, when you make a sperm, each cell that splits becomes two sperm and it gets half. Now, he did not know any of these things. No, but he could tell when things reproduce, these traits can be divided. So they are not locked together. He also had the second law of independence of assortment, which is that these different traits can separate independently. So like a white flowered, wrinkly seeded, inflated pod plant, each of those can be separated individually. So you could get one half that's white, wrinkled, and uh, uh, inflated. But if they have the genes for the others, you could also get white, non-wrinkled, constricted. They can be mix and matched. And then the key part, the law of dominance, that some traits overshadow others. That if you have a plant with purple flowers and a plant with white flowers, and a plant gets both of those traits, the purple overpowers the white. Dominant. Dominant genes. If you have one of these, you are purple. But if a thing with purple-white traits, purple-white genes, mates with another one with purple-white genes, some of their offspring are going to have white-white and will show up white, because those are recessive. That's what I am all over the place, a redhead. <laughs> so, a colorblind redhead. A colorblind, blue-eyed redhead. 
It's recessive, 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 recessive. And so both of my parents are brunettes. So like it was hiding in their DNA. It was skulking. And that's what he discovered is that genes don't work in a blending way. They can be separated and reshuffled and they don't always express themselves the way you would expect. But you could suddenly have a trait pop out in the group of offspring that was being uh, tamped down in the genetics. So Darwin figured out natural selection, while Mendel figured out inheritance. Yes. Uh, but they weren't brought together while either of those two men were alive. No, because while Darwin was vastly famous and everyone started looking at not everyone accepted it right away, but everyone started reading his book and responding to it, Mendel tried to get people interested in his, and nobody cared. <laughs> We've mentioned this in, in episode 28, I believe, that Darwin was in possession of Mendel's works. Like, he had Mendel's book on his bookshelf, but we don't know if he ever read it. Yeah, one of the issues that Mendel ran into was that not many other people, not many other botanists, were trained in math. Ah, interdisciplinary studies. Statistical analysis was not the norm in biology yet. This is something that I've heard modern scientists complain about. <laughs> exactly. So when people read his work, they didn't get it. They didn't understand what he was talking about. He was like, yes, and then we have a three to one ratio of offspring from F1 and F2 generation. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Yeah, sure. Yeah. All right, monk guy. Good. So he eventually gave up and just focused on his monastery he died in 1884 and was remembered as a very good monk with a uh, <laughs> decent skill at breeding plants. It wasn't yeah, until poor, poor dude. It wasn't until the 1900, about 15 years after he died, that we rediscovered his work and went, "Oh <laughs> no, this is wow! This is great stuff. Can you get this guy in here?" <laughs> and no. since then, we have combined the two. Yeah, we've synthesized them, you might say. In the modern synthesis. Now, modern is a little bit of a uh, misnomer now because <laughs> it's 2019. Yeah, this was this this started the better part of 100 years ago that slowly but surely a number of notable scientists started knitting together Mendel's concepts and Darwin's concepts and finding that boy, oh boy, this goes together better than peanut butter and chocolate. <laughs> People finally went, oh, there's evidence from genetics, and there's evidence from ecology, and there's evidence from fossils, and there's evidence from math, and it all seems to be pointing the same way. So this was the fusion of Mendelian genetics and Darwinian evolution, often called Neo-Darwinism, or Neo-Darwinian theory. This had some major changes to the way we viewed evolution. Probably the biggest one is that the definition shifted slightly. The definition I used earlier is the the general description of what happens during evolution. The much more precise and technical version is that evolution is changes in allele frequency, alleles are the different traits, in a population. That a, evolution occurs when a certain trait, a certain allele, becomes more or less common within a population. It's as simple as that. <laughs> that this that's this really brought it down, and this emphasizes the genetic basis of evolution. And that's kind of what we've been working off of since then. The other thing that changed is we now recognize that natural selection was not the only mechanic for evolution. Natural selection was still a major pushing factor for evolution, but it was not the only pressure. We have now four main forces of evolution. Natural selection still is the most obvious that you can see because it's the only pressure that directly increases a organism's success for survival. Right. Just as Darwin described it, that you have a, a trait that makes you more likely to survive, you pass it on to your offspring. That is that passive selection of natural selection. The others are much more uncaring universe <laughs> in the fact that they don't have a pressured direction of success failure. The other three are genetic drift. This is when alleles change in frequency for random reasons. 
Yeah, the most famous example of this is, and I think we mentioned this before, probably in our Islands episode, I mm-hmm. would imagine, back in episode four, the founder effect. Yes. That if a portion of your population is split off from the rest, or if there's a big catastrophe and only a small portion of your population remains, whatever genes happened to be in that small segment are now going to become the most common traits in your population because that's what you were you started with. To use me as an example again, why are there certain countries in the world where almost everyone looks like me and is red-haired, fair skin, and freckled? Founder effects. Because <laughs> that's just what those people happened to have when they went over there. You can also, genetic drift can be caused by random events. The one guy with two colored eyes in your in your tribe gets struck by lightning. Well, that's not an option anymore. <laughs> nope. And there goes that allele. That's, that is not natural selection. <laughs> no one is less likely to get struck by lightning or <laughs> to survive <No>. it. <laughs> that just happens sometimes. So the, it's random success and failure. The lucky ones, as some people like to describe it. The other one is gene flow. This is physical movement. I, a redhead, go over to the brunette colony, or a person from our tribe who has a genetic quality leaves it physically. You know, they didn't die. Nothing happened to them. They just aren't here anymore, or they are here now. So we we have actually moved the genetics around and intermixed them with a new population. There's that migration again. Migration! We, we have brought over... This group from over there, now we're hybridizing. Now, we, now we've now we got these snakes that used to be on that part of the lake have moved over here, and they're close enough that now we are shifting our genetics around. Oh, hello, neighbor. Oh, hello. hello. And then the final one, this one is key to genetics, is mutation. And this is around the time that we had finally discovered, properly started to, to learn about genetics. Now we are really unlocking the Pandora's box of genetics. Mutation. Mutation. It's the force that has taken us from single-celled organisms. <laughs> as the, y'all remember that X-Men movie? Yeah, that was a good time. <laughs> Mutation is an interesting one because it is both one of the most subtle of these pressures, but also most critical. Because mutation is completely random. It can be beneficial, neutral, or harmful, and majority of them aren't good, because when your DNA suddenly changes on you, it's, it's usually bad. Yeah. So mutation is very random, and it's not happening cons- consistently. So it can happen suddenly a lot if you're around radioactive material, and then not so much if you're like certain insects that only divide your cells when you shed your skin. So... It's not consistent, but it is crucial because it's what provides variation in characteristics that the others are are messing with. Right. Sexual reproduction and various other things can mix around what traits are available. Mutation can develop new combinations of genetics, new features that weren't there before. And that's where mutation steps in. So now we have driving factors we have a view of evolution that incorporates the physical and the genetic and we're really starting to get a a modern view of it and this is effectively what we work off of today it's also important to note that it is in this time the early 1900s that we finally came up with reliable ways to determine the ages of things in the past yes very true so p- prior to this, we had the geologic time scale, episode 12. We had organized the events of the past. Now we were finally starting to be able to say, oh, okay, this happened 30 million years ago. This happened 120 million years ago. And that helps us to organize all of this evolution from before now. Now, this is not to say, all right, we're done. We did it. Everybody. Hooray. We all shook hands. Modern synthesis. Pat on and the we back. Skipped, skipped merrily into the 1940s. Pat on the back. We figured it out. There are still questions to be asked. There are still parts that just do not have a really clean answer to them yet. And there are some people who have actually come out to say the modern synthesis was great, but we've learned more and we should update it. So you will see some claims out there. We actually got a question from a listener about this. 
on saying that we should introduce a new synthesis, the extended evolutionary synthesis. Now, this first was suggested in like the 1950s, and it's been like popping back up every now and then. It was popped up in like 2007, you know, fairly recently of some people saying we should include these new concepts that we now are aware of, and we need to kind of reformat things. The big ones that they point out are things like ontogeny, recognizing that things that organisms change vastly as they develop. The Evo Devo, which is that early development developmental biology and how it uh, relates to the evolution of animals. And the big one, epigenetics. Yep. Epigenetics was a Pandora's box inside of Pandora's box when we <laughs> discovered that. Epigenetics, when I first learned about this, I literally had like a... I just shut down for a moment because there was so much to comprehend. Epigenetics is some when we realized that Whilst your traits are written by your DNA, they are not set in stone whilst you are alive. Certain environmental factors can shut down and turn on genes. And now this sounds huge and dramatic, but it's also important to remember that this is part of the reason why your body is able to do different things in different situations. Like when you get sick or when you hit puberty or when you're developing as an embryo, like different genes are turning on and turning off in different places in response to different out external factors. And that's Constantly. governed by epigenetic signals, signatures, epigenetic molecules. And it's been fairly recently that it has become a major field of study and we've realized how much this can affect you and that some of these are heritable that you can pass on a gene that was switched off in your lifetime can affect how your child develops which means lamarck and his inheritance of acquired characteristics wasn't totally wrong <laughs> no so a lot of people have said maybe that means it well yes and no yes a pregnant woman during famine times is more likely to have a child who puts on weight more easily. That's something that they actually discovered in a population. Yep. But the DNA is not different. How the DNA is being expressed is different. So it's just, you you know, when you turn lights on and on, off and on in your house, you're not removing those lights. They're still there and they could flip back. You're not becoming a new species this way. Now we don't, we're still unpacking epigenetics and realizing how much there is to it so this could change but it is still not direct you're not you know oh i had i gave birth to a new species i'm glad you made that clarification that's a good analogy there is definitely some weirdness what you do to your body today can affect your grandchildren in the future or, to put it in a much less fair sounding way, the problems <laughs> you have now might be because of something that your grandparents did. Yes, so one will guilt you, the other one lets us rage. <laughs> <laughs> now, there's a lot we can unpack with the modern synthesis. There was some amazing studies that went into this. The famous uh, fly room with Thomas Hunt Morgan is a big one where they uh, identified chromosomes in fruit flies. We could go through all of that. That's another episode, folks. That is too yeah, much. This is this is already a this is a huge story. But we just tried to tell the entire story, like we said at the beginning, <laughs> several <laughs> centuries of science. So we're gonna we're gonna wrap things up here. And if you want to know more about any of these 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 parts of our path toward evolution, understanding evolution, let us know, and we'll be happy to make a follow-up episode or a modern synthesis episode or a Lamarck episode or blah, 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 blah. Yeah, and who knows? In several years, maybe we'll have to update this episode. <laughs> Absolutely. But for now, I, I think we're going to go ahead and wrap it up. Thanks again for checking in and listening. Hope you enjoyed our path through the evolutionary history of the evolutionary theory. Check out the store because it's up now. So don't forget that you can go get some merch and and have your own evolutionary tree to, to yeah, commemorate this this episode remind you where uh, you came from yes thanks again brian for inspiring us to go through this historical trek and our new patrons welcome 
As usual, we'll ha put links up on the blog. And I, there's a ton of links for this one. So read up. Let us know if you have questions, if you have topic ideas through the usual ways. Social media, email, all that good stuff. We release new episodes every fortnight. So one fortnight away. Keep an eye out for episode 57, which is going to be super special. Just you wait. Woo! And we'll see you next time. That's all we got, everyone. Toodles for now. Bye. Thanks for listening to the Common Descent Podcast. You can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and check our WordPress blog for pictures and links after each episode. Huge thanks to our patrons whose support helps keep this podcast running and who get access to bonus goodies on Patreon. The song you're hearing is called On the Origin of Species by Protodome, which we found at ocremix.org. Thanks again for listening. We hope you'll join us next time.